Hello and welcome back to Cinematic Universe, everyone. My name is Ernesto Martinez, and joining me, as always, is the animation guru and co-author of Woven, David Powers King. How are you, man? I'm doing well, and how are you? Uh, a little happy after what I did today, so... Yeah, no need to get into detail with that, but yeah, it's been a good day so far. Um, it's nighttime, so the air is really cool, so nobody has to lose their shit over anything. Uh, what do we have? Hotel Transylvania 2, with Adam Sandler as Dracula, Andy Samberg as Jonathan, Selena Gomez as Mavis, Kevin James as Frankenstein, Steve Buscemi as Wayne, David Spade as Griffin, Keegan-Michael Key as Murray, Fran Drescher as Eunice, Molly Shannon as Wanda, Megan Mullally as Grandma Linda, Nick Offerman as Grandpa Mike, I knew I recognized that voice somewhere when that was him, Dana Carvey as well, Dana himself, Rob Riggle, and Mel Brooks as Vlad. So, what'd you think? You know, I um, was very surprised how much I liked this one, to tell you the truth. I mean, I enjoyed the first one. Um, the uh, the guy who directed it, Gendy, um, I've always enjoyed his style, like as far back as his early work with the Cartoon Network, and he just has this really fun, zany style that has its own charm to it. It really brings you back to the joy of just straight-up cartoons, mm -hmm. you know, the sight gags and the fast motion, the quick pace that he usually goes about and does things like that. And um, But for some strange reason, I kind of felt like it hit me a little bit more in a personal way, and it was, uh, I mean, and what's the difference between this and the previous one is that it's a bonding film. Mm -hmm. Something that we don't get to see very much often as is, uh, you know, grandparent and grandchild bonding movies. Yeah. So I thought uh, that was one aspect of this film did that is kind of a unique thing to see. So that was refreshing as well, and of course it was funny. I've always enjoyed the classic monsters, mm -hmm. and this group puts it together in a way that makes it enjoyable and also approachable for young audiences. That, the whole, this move, the first one was mostly Dracula having to accept that, you know, there are humans in the world, he's trying to run a hotel, and then all of a sudden a human walks in, and everybody loses their marbles. It's like, a human! And all that stuff. And then <laughs> Mavis, his vampire daughter, falls in love with him. And he has to deal with the fact that there's going to be a commingling. And he doesn't want to. But, you know, like, you know, they have to accept the fact that his daughter is going to marry or be with somebody that is of a different species and not a vampire. And, you know, he comes to grips with that. And in this one, he's based, basically for Dracula. He just has to, you know except that things are going to be changing and it's going to be hard, especially with being a grandfather and everything and needing to learn that, well, it's not always going to be this way. It has to change at some point because, you know, life moves on. Life, life has to, you know, evolve and everything. I got to say, I still find the first one to be the cutest and funniest of the two. But this one still had enough cute factor and comedy to be enjoyable. And it was very enjoyable. I actually enjoyed it a little bit much more than the Minions movie. But for completely different reasons. I mean, Minions is Minions. This one is just on its own. It's not going to be a billion dollar marketing behemoth as Minions was in entertainment or product placement and all that stuff. But this one, is, I don't know, that family aspect and everything, you know, it's very unique. And they play it off really well. The comedy, I swear, there were times where I was... I mean, you're in a theater full of parents and their children. And a few couples there who just want to see, a, you know, a, a cute kids movie. I'm the single guy in the center in the third row going... Ah! <laughs> Every time something great happens and I feel like people are watching me. And I'm like, I don't care. I'm in, having the time of my life. Um, and that's actually something that's... A real joy about a movie like this one because it's fun. Yeah. I mean, you know, this isn't the type of movie that you go in to cry. 
This isn't the type of movie that you expect to split a gut over, Mm -hmm. but you're going to be smiling and you're going to be entertained. And that's kind of the point of this film is about is that, I mean, you're entertained and that's exactly what they're going for. Yeah. And they accomplish that. Yeah. I will, however, I do have some complaints, but before we get into that, um, if you haven't seen the movie or if you have seen the movie, we will get into some spoilers. And this one, basically, right now, the hotel is being, you know, the idea is for the hotel to be open, not just to the monster world, but the human world. And, of course, it's a kid's family movie, so it's not going to be like, oh, it's going to take ages for the, the idea that humans are not going to be commingling with monsters that they never knew existed until today. And they kind of take care of that like that. Like they're all, everybody's already already used to the idea that a Frankenstein exists, that the the Wolfman exists, that the mummy exists, that the invisible man, invisible man exists. They're all used to that. Like at this point, the movie just makes it clear that the human world already knows these people are there. They want to take selfies with Frankenstein and all that stuff, which is one of my negatives, but that's basically the world this movie has set up with the sequel. And Mavis and Jonathan have a child who is, you know, we're assuming that he's half vampire and half human. And the whole plot of this movie is that Dracula, he can't accept the idea that he's going to have a grandchild after hundreds and hundreds to thousands of years of a lineage of the Dracul line and not have a grandson who can continue that legacy. That's the one thing that's bothering him. He wants that child to be, you know, part vampire, because if he's not, it's going to destroy his world. And hijinks ensues. He does everything possible to make sure the kid has his fangs. And then you have Mavis, the new mother, and Jonathan, the new father, and they're going to be your typical new parents. They... Think this is the best thing for their child. They have a schedule set up for him. They have some educational learning video tapes for them. Things that when you put yourself in in that position, you can relate to. But it's like, this is what entertainment goes for. Not what I used to do when I was a kid. That kind of stuff. And it's been done before, but it's still it's a formula that still works. And if you and if you throw in the aspect that this is a, not just an animated movie, but it has the monster movies, the monster movie characters, What, what's not to love? Seriously, what's not to love? Now, that being said, here are my negatives with this movie. I took a quick glance at who were the writers for the first one and who were the writers for the second one. And while I couldn't pinpoint the names exactly, there was one key difference. Adam Sandler was not serving as co-writer on the first one. He was co-writer on this one. And that's where some of the things that I kind of had a problem with because, you know, Adam Sandler for the past, I guess, decade, if I want to be generous, hasn't exactly been the Adam Sandler that people, you know, like. He's just been, ah, that kind of Adam Sandler, making, you know, gross-out humor movies that really are just, you know, for like the lowest common denominator type of audience, and somehow they still make money. No offense to people who are listening who are fans of his movies. I'm just saying, there ha- there hasn't exactly been a, that good of an Adam Sandler movie. And here, all he has to do is just provide his voice and do what other people tell him. So you're like, whew, okay, so we can work with that. Here, this movie, even for an animated movie, had a lot of product placement i.e. Sony. I mean, I never expected to see an animated movie where the phones that they use actually say Sony. (laughs) The Sony brand. So I'm like, oh no, please no, no, don't do that. Don't. And they do. They make some pop culture references that kind of date the movie already. Because the first one kind of seemed like it was a timeless kind of an ordeal. This one just kind of dated itself with those pop culture references that you really didn't need. I mean, this is one of those situations where instead of putting like a Nicki Minaj song, you could have just made something to parody it and just have, you know, not make it seem too obvious that you're trying to be hip with the audience. I mean, it's only been like a two, two, three year difference between the movies, so there was no need for it. 
And then you had the thing was like, dude, let's take a selfie. This needs to be awesome. That stuff, you, you didn't need that. You know, stuff like that, those pop culture references, things that people are doing today that's trending. And also they address social media. There's no problem addressing social media because you're not going to be able to escape it. It's a fun dynamic that you can introduce to characters who are literally the epitome of old school. These are monster characters. They're the old school people. You can do, you can have fun with that, but not to the point where it's in your face. And I kind of felt like they were going in your face with some of those references, but thankfully those are most of the negatives. The rest overshadows it completely, but those negatives kind of hurt a bit because, you know, it's not necessary, especially for an animated movie. Animated movies are supposed to be timeless, not dated. Yeah, I had noticed those things as well. Um, and at the same time, I was able to look over it for the most part. Like, mm -hmm. it wasn't so much of a distraction that it was keeping me from enjoying what was going on. Um, but there was also a, a certain level of detail in this film as well. I thought that the the pictures and the art and the animation itself was a little bit crisper mm -hmm. uh, and uh, clearer, better rendered than the previous one. That just might be that they are able to update um, their equipment. Of course, yeah. I don't know that for sure. Um, and... The, and something I appreciated a bit more about this movie is mm -hmm. that it seemed a bit more grounded than the first one. I mean, don't get me wrong, I, re I, I did enjoy the first film, but I kind of got dizzy watching it. Like, we were flying around <laughs> all the time. Just, just the camera, like, you know, like it was, a, it was almost as if you just had like some kind of drone flying around doing flips and... Yeah all over the place, but here, it felt like someone had actually planted the camera, and you could actually s look at the details this time, instead of everything going by in a blur most of the time. Yeah. And I like that aspect of the film. Um, and while it kind of slowed the movie down a little bit in the beginning, it kind of felt like the first 20 minutes or so was something of a, a, of a travel log. Mm -hmm. Or maybe not a travelogue, but a timeline. Because we're basically picking up with the marriage of Mavis and Jonathan. Mm -hmm. Through pregnancy, through birth, through a first birthday, yeah. until almost five-year birthday. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it kind of had a... It almost kind of had like a uh, the beginning of up feel. But, like, if they had a child. And without the emotional weight to it. Without the emotional weight to it, exactly. Which I, I kind of had, had Although I kind of had to imagine myself, when you go and tell your father that you're going to have a child, and the way you go about doing so is by turning into a bat and then flying around in the clouds, I was kind of thinking, you know... It's recommended that you don't go on roller coasters. <laughs> and stuff here, right? and I don't know what turning into a bat... And doing tricks and stuff in the clouds is going to do to your I, developing child. But you know what? Maybe that's what uh, helped ensure the child's uh, draconian. I don't know. I think that was basically like if you're going to bond with your father, I guess you, and to surprise him with it, I guess you do it in the one thing that she enjoyed doing with her father the most, which was flying around and doing stuff like that. So I guess that was which like... Was fun. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, it's just a curious question to me. Yeah, I find it a bit weird that that's the only way that her bump could show because it didn't seem like she had a bump when she was. It did, in. yeah. Yeah, I do agree. That's kind of like I guess somebody forgot to, you know, you forgot the bump when she was in human form, but it was it was cute. It's like he was very happy. He's not one of those guys that like flipped at first. He's like, you know, oh, the lineage is continuing. <laughs> yeah. But the special treat of this film for me was hearing Mel Brooks' voice again on the big screen after yes. so many years. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I, he may have, I don't know, but I think the last time I've heard him on screen was uh, Robin Hood, Men in Tights, mm. and so it was just very cool to hear his voice again, and not only hear his voice, but play a really good, great grandpa character. 
Yeah, he's basically. He was just playing, really fun. He's basically playing one, one of, if not the most important adaptation of the vampire lore, Vlad. I mean, for a comedy, who better to get than Mel Brooks? I mean, Mel Brooks could have a field day playing a character that's like very old school, and if you don't, you know, abide by the stern laws of the Dracul. Yeah, Mel Grimms is the perfect guy for that kind of character. And you know what I noticed? They, they like to play up how powerful Dracula and especially Vlad are in this universe. I'm like, my God, this guy's overpowered as hell. I mean, he does things that I'm like, can Dracula actually do that stuff? It's like he can save the world if he wanted to if it weren't for the fact that he can't be outside during the day I mean and then you see Vlad doing his supernatural stuff and I'm like these people are way too powerful <laughs> it's something that I just noticed I'm like wow I didn't really think about it until just now how powerful these characters are it's an, it's a, it's amazing I love Denisovich yes. yeah he, he has a human name Dennis and his vampire name is Denisovich, I think. Which, one of the cutest baby characters in the movie. I mean, they tell him, he finally said his first words. And then Dracula's like, tell me, tell me. Blah, 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 blah. He's like, I do not go, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I love that so much. It was perfect. It just was. I mean... You know, you had the first movie when Dracula is singing a lullaby to his daughter when she's just a baby. And he has that little reaction where it's like, Daddy's gonna go away. He does that. That was cute. This one tops it with the kid going, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, again, grandfather, grand grandchild, perfect. It's right there. The magic is right there. And that's where this movie wins you over, whether you're the child or the parent or the grandparent. It transcends right there. So it's a good family experience. I will say my the funniest part of the whole movie, this is just me, when they're trying to go down to the camp and they're lost and they're on that ghost coach mobile and you have Blobby, the, that character, on the side. And they kind of miss a turn. They make a, a left turn suddenly. And then Blobby breaks free from the ghoulmobile. And he goes flying off the cliff. <laughs> the transition to that, to the next scene where Dracula's looking outside the window. And everybody's like paused, froze. I was crying in the theater. I couldn't stop laughing. Because like you said about Gendy's animation style. When he does those little pause moments. And it's supposed to be humor. It works. And I'm just like, you see Vlad just looking out the window like, oh shit, we fucked up. <laughs> that's the, yeah, that's the dramatic pause and it works. Yes. I mean, because, I mean, everyone knows something is up and they are, you know, and, and not just like everyone, you got the whole cast. So you have the classic monsters all frozen going like, um, <laughs> how do we react to this? <laughs> Dracula's just coming I'm back. I'm still laughing. Like, I can't stop okay. thinking about it. He's blobby. Exactly. It's okay. He's blobby. <laughs> Which, God bless the blobby character, because that guy went through so much hell in this movie, and he still comes out going, burr, burr. <laughs> You gotta love the blobby character. I mean, yeah, I, I mean... Books, well, and I think the one thing that probably got the, the biggest chuckle out of me was the, uh, the GPS app. <laughs> that phone. I want that app so bad because, <laughs> I mean, come on. Who doesn't want an app that will tell you, turn right. Turn, turn right. right now. <laughs> you imbecile. <laughs> you missed you know, it, you imbecile. <laughs> I, would, I mean, come on. Who doesn't want a GPS that insults you? Yeah, that's that was, especially when it was Dracula who was holding the GPS. He was getting insulted the whole way. But yeah, uh, I really recommend this movie. I mean, there aren't that many kids' movies out right now until the, until fall hits. But yeah, go see this movie while you have the chance. Take your family, take your grandparents. 
I mean, Mel Brooks, that's enough to tell your grandfather, Grandpa, Mel Brooks is in the movie. Well, let's go. Like, you know, I, I really recommend this movie. Even with the negatives I pointed out, it's still overall a very enjoyable movie. And it's something, you know, it's a learning lesson. This movie really is a learning lesson about, you know, accepting things the way they are and loving your family members no matter what their uh, ups and downs are, whether they are how you want them or whether they're not. You still have to love them as a family. And it's good social commentary, especially the, with the world that we have today with people having, you know, different sexualities than other people, people being raised differently than other people's children. You know, you have to, you know, respect some people's boundaries and, you know, accept it the way they are. Now, of course, you know, every family is different, so everybody's going to have their growing pains. Everybody's going to still have the, a parent to listen to and a parent to... It's a teaching process. It's like the TV show on NBC, Parenthood. You have grandpa, you have father, and you have the children. And all three of them learn as they go. And that's pretty much everything that it is. And you have a family, so you're going to be a grandpa in 20 years from now, I'm guessing. So you'll track back to this moment where we're talking about Hotel Transformation 2. And I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and this, uh, the second one has great, it has good uh, rewatchability value to it. So, I mean, this is something that I'll be able to enjoy with my kids again. Yeah. What do you think the third one will be about? I'm not sure. I mean, and do they have plans for a third one? I haven't I seen would, it. I would like, assume that they will. I mean, they already won the, the box office weekend. Yeah, and you're right. I mean, the previous September record was Hotel Transylvania, and Hotel Transylvania 2 just beat that. Yeah. So, so a third one so, should I mean, be happening. The films are successful. I have no doubt that they might go about and do a third one. Um, but it's really up in the air at this point. Yeah. If I may be so bold, I would assume that if they wanted to, because this movie, they it lives in its own universe. And they can play with the timelines like they did in the opening of this one. They play with like a five-year timeline, even though between the two movies, it's not that far off. But if they wanted to, they could do an adult, they could like age the child, Dennis, to an adolescent or maybe a tween. And have him have a relationship with the wolf girl in this movie. That could be a possibility where, oh, the child's first date and the parents and the grandparents are all meddling in their stuff. Another family dynamic that happens a lot. So that could be the, a possible idea for the third one. And considering that vampires and werewolves are... Not the not commingling type. I mean, even worse than, than getting along with humans, right? Yeah. Which, that's going to be interesting with the Steve Buscemi characters. It's like... Dude, we've been friends for hundreds and hundreds of years, and now you have a problem with your daughter dating a vampire? <laughs> that's that's going to be hilarious. Steve Buscemi arguing with Adam Sandler in an animated movie. That's going to be great. So hopefully they do something like that. Or I, I trust, if Gendy is still up for doing a third one, I trust he and crew will come up with something great. Well, David, thanks a lot for joining me for doing this. Um, thank you, everybody, for listening. Any final thoughts? Keep it tight. Keep it tight, all right. Uh, for my final rating for this movie, I kind of give it like a 3.5 out of 5, if that's, you know, you know, fair, still enjoyable. What would you give it? Same. I would give it a 3.5. Out of 5, all right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. You can find me on Twitter, at MartinezXYZ, and you can find me on my new website, Movie Pilot. Just follow, just look for Cinematic Universe. David, where can people find you? And you can find me on Twitter at David Powers King. And you can check out my blog and see what I'm up to at DavidPowersKing.com. All right. And if you're still wondering where my Scorch Trials review is, be patient. It's coming. All right, everybody. Bye-bye.